Hello everyone. This engagement video is uh, on beer history. The specific topic is the Reinheitsgebot. I'm your instructor, Marty Nachel, and I'm involved in the business of craft beer certificate program at COD. Now the Reinheitsgebot in English is basically the German beer purity law. This is what most everyone recognizes it as. But the truth is, when it was written several hundred years ago, Germany did not exist as the state that we recognize it today. So it was the Reinheitsgebot was more formally known as the Bavarian Beer Edict. Bavaria did not join Germany until the 1900s. So let's take a look at some Reinheitsgebot facts. It's dated April 23rd, 1516, which means it's about to celebrate its 504th anniversary. It was decreed by Bavarian Duke Wilhelm IV. It's considered by many to be the very first consumer protection law ever written. And although most people focus on the fact that it stipulates which ingredients can be used to make beer, there are other issues involved in the Reinheitsgebot, including how it emphasizes serving sizes. The Maas and the Kopf are both German beer drinking vessels. The yeah, Reinheitsgebot also stipulates how much should be charged per serving of these beers. We also know that the Reinheitsgebot changed over the years to include additional ingredients that did not appear in the original document. So, summing it up, the original intent of the decree was threefold. Number one, to control pricing of beer. Number two, to ensure the quality of beer. And number three, to reserve more valuable grains like wheat and rye for bread making as these grains were very often in short supply. So here's a look at the original document and you can see the heading and you can see the signatures at the bottom and you can see the uh, official uh, seal. Um, the document itself written in the original German uh, contains five paragraphs, some of them being very short. We're going to take a look at those briefly. Uh, the first paragraph essentially stipulated when beer should be served. You can see there are some dates there, September 29th and April 23rd. Uh, these are the dates between such and such a date they could serve it in such and such a vessel and char charge so much per uh, serving. All right. And in the, I'm going to skip to the third paragraph. This essentially reminds everybody uh, whoever doesn't follow these rules will pay the penalties according to law. Uh, this uh, makes provisions for certain purveyors, whether they're in the city or in the marketplace or out in the country, how much they should be charging for the beer. And uh, this segment uh, basically summarizes what you see above. I'm going to skip up to the second paragraph. This is what most people focus on. This is why it's called the beer purity law. If you take a closer look at that, we can see this is the paragraph that spells out which ingredients can be used, and it's extremely simple. You take a look towards the end of the last sentence in this paragraph, it mentions Gersten, Hopfen, und Wasser. And what this means in English is barley, hops, and water. Those are considered the only allowable ingredients in German beer making. So why these specific ingredients? Well, because there were unscrupulous brewers who were adding unhealthy ingredients, and it is said that people were dying from drinking some of the beer. The government was also protecting bakers by disallowing wheat and rye and other less available grains, keeping brewers to using only barley. It also disallowed using sugar in the brewing process because it was seen as a means of cheapening beer, even though many brewers continue to do that today, especially in Belgium. And of course, in 1516, yeast was not even considered an ingredient and would not be for another couple hundred years upon the invention of the microscope when they realized that yeast was an important ingredient in beer. So what does the Reinheitsgebot look like today? Well, it was not until the 1900s that the law was applied consistently across all of Germany. That is when Bavaria joined the German state. Uh, in 1987, the Reinheitsgebot was considered protectionist and anti-trade and was struck down by the European Court of Justice on behalf of the other countries 
in the European Union. In other words, the other countries in the EU basically said to Germany, we're not following your rules. Uh, Germans did continue uh, complying with the Reinheitsgebot if they were selling beer within Germany. And it's still practiced voluntarily by German brewers for their export beers. Um, and it's still believed today to be a very valuable marketing tool when brewers can label their beers being compliant with the Reinheitsgebot. That is added value according to the consumers. And as a matter of fact, this verbiage was often used by the early American craft brewers as a way to help marketing their product. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson on the Reinheitsgebot. To everyone I say cheers and post.